everyone. My name is Renee Long, one of the social media specialists and webinar coordinators here at ACHS, the American College of Healthcare Sciences. Um, today with me behind the scenes for all our technical issues and, and needs is Dominic Aiello, the other social media specialist and webinar coordinator. Today we'll be hosting a very special webinar in honor of PTSD Awareness Month. Joining us today is ACHS alumnus, Lieutenant and Paramedic Tim Grutzius. Today he will be presenting on the topic Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder, Holistic Wellness as a Path to a More Balanced Life. Thank you so much for joining us today, Tim, and welcome everyone to our webinar. Um, just a few housekeeping items before we get started. You may have noticed that your line has been muted. We are already recording today's webinar, so this helps ensure that we can clearly hear our presenter. You'll also notice that you have a control panel at the right-hand side of your screen. If you have a question you would like me to write down for the Q&A at the end of the webinar, go ahead and type it into the questions box. We will have a 10-minute Q&A period at the end of the webinar, so if you have questions as we go, go ahead and type them into the questions box at the bottom of your control panel. I'll go ahead and write them down, and I'll read them to Tim at the end. If you have further questions that require a bit more research or if you um, need some links or papers sent to you, go ahead and feel free to follow up with our presenter directly at tandj1096 at yahoo.com. And he's happy to respond to all of your questions, but please be sure to give him some time to get back to you. And now I'll go ahead and turn the webinar over to our presenter. We'll give a brief introduction and then begin the lecture. Welcome, Tim. You should now have control of the webinar. How you doing there, Renee? All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Tim Grutzius, and I'm a lieutenant paramedic at the Alsop Fire Department. I've been there about 20 years, and I'm also an ACHS alum where I received my diploma last year in holistic health practice and certificate in wellness consulting. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is a very important topic, uh, and it's near and dear to my heart which is that of post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, it's something that became, it's something that happened uh, several years ago, but it became more relevant in the last uh, few months here for me. Uh, and I also have a blog, you'll see that at then in helpful links where I have uh, chronicled my struggle with post-traumatic stress as well as treatment options that I explored and it was more from a camp perspective because I'm somebody that is really not uh, hip on using medications. Uh, one thing that was unique about being a student here is that through all of our lectures, all of our labs, we were always asked to become the human experiment as I call it where we would have to try something whether it was flower essences aromatherapy, herbs, as a way of trying to naturally balance and support our systems. Uh, and all, every step of the way when I went through school, I had uh, journaled and documented everything. So as we go along, it'll become uh, more relevant for you. What I'm hoping to gain in here is that after this webinar, you're going to be able to distinguish the difference between acute versus chronic stress reactions such as post-traumatic stress disorder, define a list of causes of post-traumatic stress, and then distinguish between the three types of post-traumatic stress symptoms as outlined by the National Institute of Mental Health, and then learn about holistic protocols that may prove useful in supporting the body system of a person who suffers from post-traumatic stress. Now, I'll just put this out to you that, as we know, in holism, everybody is unique. So what I did worked for me, and I'm hoping that anybody that is in similar circumstances or if you have clients that may be suffering from not only post-traumatic stress but stress in general, uh, that the information that I'm going to share with you because of my lessons learned, I hope that it will make uh, anybody out there who's suffering from post-traumatic stress or a practitioner their life easier or at least a direction with which to go to try and help somebody. So I'm going to start with my story that began about 16 years ago. Uh, this is something that I wrote in the English 101 class uh, as part of a narrative on something that changed my life forever. 16 years ago on a cold damp February night my outlook on life changed forever. 
the alarm sounded at 1940 hours or 740 p.m. for a vehicle that had exploded. My assignment for the day was to drive the fire engine to the scene and make sure that water was put on the fire. My heart began to race as I thought, this is going to be a bad one. Upon arrival, the lieutenant, I, and another firefighter could see a column of heavy black smoke rising as black as the sky from the rear of their apartment building parking lot. Lieutenant and other firefighter nicknamed Ski pulled the hose line off of the engine and disappeared behind the building into the night. Suddenly, I heard my water shout in a booming voice, Get us water, quick! Within a few minutes, the fire was extinguished and the job complete, or so I thought. The next thing I knew, an ambulance that also responded pulled out from behind the building. I peered through the window and saw three medics treating a charred, lifeless body that was pulled from a pickup truck that had exploded. My lieutenant, who was driving the ambulance, never looked my way as he sped off to the hospital. I thought this to be odd behavior as the Lou always gave us additional instructions. While I was picking up equipment, Ski emerged from behind the building and said in a soft voice, it was little Dicky. Tears began to stream down my face as I collapsed to the ground, sobbing uncontrollably. You see, little Dicky, a fellow firefighter I worked with for the last three years, just committed suicide. It was determined that he had poured gasoline over himself and ignited it with a lighter. One month prior, little Dicky made an attempt to end his life, only this time he was successful. After that night, I realized that we are put on this earth for a very short time and it should be our life's mission to leave the world a little better off than we found it. Therefore, I developed a personal mantra that I try to live by each day, which is, Every morning I wake up and realize that there are many people in this world who want to be somebody. I, on the other hand, want to be somebody who makes a difference. Now, how does this be how does something that happened 16 years ago suddenly in the last few months become relevant to me? The culture of the fire service at that time and sometimes still today is that we have to show very little emotion when we're dealing with the public especially when we have to try to make order out of chaos. Uh, we didn't really deal well with this in the, in the aftermath of the days following. Uh, we were, I should go back. On that night, we were given a critical incident stress debriefing for about an hour and a half or so. We were relieved of duty, but then three days later, we returned to duty. During that time, prior to going to this gentleman's wake, we had to deal with. We had to go and respond to somebody who had died, and it was about four days before uh, we had found him. But then we went for a regular patient of ours who was mid 40s, and he was suffering from chronic pain, and he had also committed suicide. So that put us in system overload. Uh, if you would go to my blog, you would see where I talk about the aftermath. And for brevity's sake, I'm going to leave it to that. If you like, you could email me and I could send you the exact links to everything that I referred to in there regarding this story. Uh, only just because we have an hour, it would be hard for me to go into everything. Needless to say, after a period of five years, uh, the symptoms became repressed. And I, as we go along through the through presentation, I will come back and refer to how things happen to me. But what, what made me determine that I ended up with post-traumatic stress is that a few months ago I, I was asked to take part in a workshop that was given at uh, Lewis University, it's in Romeoville, Illinois, on trauma and first responders and it was given by a psychologist who made it her life mission to help firefighters uh, work through their issues because she found out that we are a segmented population that really doesn't get any help. One of the things about our culture is that if we would ask for help or admit that we need help, it would be seen as a sign of weakness. So we never did that. We just sucked it up and moved on as was the mantra of the time. Uh, the reason it became relevant again is I had I had to write a outline similar to what I had to do for here and as I did that gone through it I had to answer questions like what happened, what went right, what went wrong, uh, what could have been done better. This presentation was given to psychology 
and human resources students at that university. As I was going through this the month prior to this, some, this uh, workshop, I started living an unexamined life and it just started stirring up old things, old feelings. It made me relive that night over and over again. The day that I did that, gave that speech and I read the same narrative that I just read to you, I couldn't even make it through the first three words without breaking down and crying. Uh, at that point I realized that I needed help. This psychologist also is the clinical director of something called the Illinois Firefighter Peer Support Group and uh, I went through that class because what it does is it it taught me how to provide psychological first aid home listening skills and I could be on call at any time to go and help a firefighter that would be in similar circumstances to myself doesn't have to be a suicide, it could be about anything, about marital problems, financial problems, etc. While I was in that class, the instructor started going over the profile of a firefighter, started talking about suicide, talking about post-traumatic stress, and as I saw myself on the screen, uh, I realized that uh, I was looking at myself in the mirror and that I needed help. And about the second day of this three-day class, I went up there and I said, you know what? I'm going to take you up on the offer to sit down and talk to you. I will come back to that uh, a little bit later on. Uh, but more importantly, I also used CAM, uh, CAM uh, protocols that I developed myself or I decided to seek the help for, which was besides psychotherapy, I also use Reiki and aromatherapy. And we're going to move on from there. Uh, this is my story. This is how I started. And as you can tell, I am way more balanced that I can now go through this, tell my story to others, read that narrative without uh, having any emotional breakdown. So what we're going to talk about first is the acute stress response. This is something I also uh, have blogged about extensively. Uh, and the acute stress response, as we know, the body is subjected to a perceived stressor such as a physical assault from an unknown assailant or jumping out of the path of a speeding car. And we're either going to do, we're either going to confront or avoid the danger. It's that fight or flight syndrome that uh, if you've taken any of your anatomy and physiology classes or even in aromatherapy, uh, this is all repeatedly talked about probably in a great deal of the classes that you're going to take at ACHS. Uh, you're looking at a firefighter right now, so if I related to the acute stress response to that, uh, if I was sleeping in the middle of the night, all of a sudden the bell or buzzer goes off or a call, usually what happens is that I feel my immediately the heart starts racing, uh, and then I start breathing a little bit faster and harder and what I have to do is try to do some deep breathing just to get my bearings in and get out of bed and respond to the call. And it all just depends on what the call is. Sometimes it's, it's something very minor as in going for a carbon monoxide investigation or it could be for a structure fire but the body is going to react the same way it's that sudden startling buzzer and bell that gets everything going. Uh, I like to liken it to the, the acute stress response and how it's such a good thing to have. If uh, somebody was being chased by a bear, it's a good thing that we have this stress response because as we're going to find out, it is something that will help us to flee that running bear if we're so lucky. I'm using that as, a, it as an exaggerated example, but whether you're trying to dodge a car, you're dodging a uh, a, a criminal chasing after you, the body's going to react the same way. And the first thing that it does is it's going to release epinephrine, and it's a hormone, fast acting hormone, that will increase our heart rate and force of contraction. And it, what also does it, it shunts blood from the less vital organs, such as digestive or even a urinary system, to the core, which is the heart, lungs, and brain, which are at that point, when you're trying to flee something, it is essential for re for uh, survival. And as we know, digestion takes a lot of energy, but at that time that you're trying to get away from something, your body doesn't need that. You don't need to be digesting any type of uh, nutrients. 
that's for later on when we recover. And the next thing, you, one of the other things that happens is that liver converts stored glycogen into glucose uh, as signaled by the hormone glucagon. Uh, and then this rush of glucose, as it is being sped through, the, because the heart is racing uh, and pushing in, the blood's flowing a lot faster, it's going to bring that glucose to the exercising muscles and it's going to supply them with energy and that's going to be necessary for us to confront or run from the unknown threat. There's also another uh, type of response that we could have which would be the freeze response but we won't cover that here uh, today. That's something if you want to ask me questions later on I can go over that with you through email. Once the threat is removed, let's say we get away from that bear or we dodge it, uh, dodge that uh, speeding car or run away from that criminal way over to hide and go to safety, the body's going to start returning to a normal relaxed state as the heart rate and blood pressure are going to decrease and the borrowed energy is returned to the digestive system, the urinary system, and then we start to reach that homeostasis once again. Acute risk stress response is something that, remember, is a normal health response. And it doesn't necessarily have to be for dangerous situations. It could also be activated in a joyous occasion, such as hearing for the first time that good friends are going to have a baby, or if you studied so hard for one of your ACH final exams, and then you get you hit that button to send it and submit it, and you find out that you scored 100%, you get this elated experience. And it's also going to probably raise that heart rate a little bit Maybe not as much as if you're trying to dodge a, a, a dangerous situation or threat, but all the same, the stress response is going to do this. It's also activated by exercise. It could be activated by sitting in traffic where it's gridlock traffic and you start complaining that, oh, I, when is it going to get moving again? You're, the, the response is going to be acute. And then maybe if that traffic eases up, then it's going to start going back down to normal again and reach that homeostasis. What happens when a stress response becomes chronic as in a case of PTSD? Uh, first of all, we'll talk about chronic stress response. In a chronic stress response, the body knows no difference between running from a bear, dodging a car, running from a criminal, if you're aggravated, you're sitting in traffic, uh, you're studying for that test or you're taking that exam, whatever the case may be, day-to-day -day living, even the environment can cause the stress response to activate as we're trying to, the body's trying to naturally detox anything that we inhale from the environment or absorb from the environment. But the body doesn't know any difference between running from a bear or sitting in traffic. It acts the same way. The same hormones are released, the same physiological response is experience. The only difference is that now it has become sustained where you, it, you're in this constant heightened state where they, your heart rate it never gets a chance to recover. You never get a chance to go back to homeostasis. So what's post-traumatic stress? And this is one type of stress to me because I've personally experienced it I find it to be an exaggerated response, uh, exaggerated stress response. Uh, it just become, it is defined by, I found it in PubMed Health as being defined as a type of anxiety disorder. Uh, the stress response remains chronic as the body continues to release the stress hormones even long after the threat of anything has passed. And in this case, I put down here danger. Uh, if we're, we're talking about somebody that was in war, and they, they keep reliving uh, IEDs exploding, seeing somebody, seeing one of their battle buddies killed, that the, they may be home, they may be in their own house, and they're no longer able to, uh, they, 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 they still think that they are experiencing this dangerous situation where that it's not the case, but the hormones are going to keep going. People who have PTSD feel stressed or frightened even though they're no longer in danger. The National Institute of Mental Health 
states that PTSD affects 7.7 .7 million Americans. In fact, something I pulled off of a website called PTSD United also says that uh, about 70% of adults in the U.S. have experienced some type of traumatic event at least once in their life. Of the 20% of them are going to go on to develop PTSD, uh, and that equals about 44.7 million people who are struggling with, uh, who are or were struggling with PTSD, and one out of every nine women are affected. That makes them twice as more as men. Some of the causes, an assault, car accidents, domestic abuse, natural disasters, prison stay, rape, terrorism, war, when he's seeing the death of another individual, as in my case, sudden death of a loved one. There are three types of PTSD symptoms uh, that have been defined by the National Institute of Mental Health. And that's reliving the event, avoidance, and hyperarousal. Reliving the event disturbs day-to-day -day activity, uh, flashback episodes, which the event seems to be happening again and again, repeated upsetting memories of the event, repeated nightmares, strong uncomfortable reactions to situations that remind you of the event. Uh, in my case, in, in the early going, probably within the first couple of years or so, for sure, uh, I, I, I was under a heightened stress response. There's no doubt about that. Uh, I had difficulty sleeping. I, I was doing a lot of stress eating. My weight went from about 160 to 186. And I'm only about uh, five foot eight, so that put me in a, a definitely the obese category. Uh, and one of the reasons, after doing some extensive research on the stress response, uh, how we end up with this overeating syndrome is it, because we're in a chronic state, we are burning up that glucose. We're, we're always going to do it. We're thinking being so it's going to activate the stress response. And because we are exhausting our glucose stores, we're going to eat more carbs to try to replace that. So that's just a little something on the side there for you to know about uh, how sometimes chronic uh, chronic uh, stress eating happens. Avoidance. Emotionally numbing or feeling as though you do not care about anything. Feel detached, not able to remember important parts of the event, not interested in normal activities, showing less of your moods, avoiding places, people, and thoughts that remind you of it, feeling like you have no future. Uh, in my case, uh, for a while, uh, the family was still in the picture. Uh, and they, they've since moved on. Uh, stuck with them a little bit here and there and made contact, but then afterwards I, I tried to shy away from that, let them get on with their own life. As far as avoiding things, you know, avoiding people, that would definitely have been something to, to see these kids because he left behind uh, three daughters. The youngest was in kindergarten at the time he killed himself. So it would just bring back ill, Ill feelings to me. Uh, Avoiding also, he's buried in a cemetery that's probably five minutes from my house, and I would never go there except I went there a few months ago, and it was the first time in 16 years. So I was trying to avoid any semblance of that. The biggest thing for me, though, where I experienced the greatest number of symptoms was under this hyperarousal. Always scanning your surroundings for signs of danger, hypervigilance. Uh, I, I can't say either way whether that's part of the PTSD that I experienced, but uh, and it's only because it's the nature of my business that I'm in as a firefighter that you're always supposed to be scanning your surroundings for signs of danger, hypervigilance. What we call that is uh, situational awareness, and that's one of the things that why I decided to go and get help is that I was concerned that with all this starting being stirred, in, stirred up in my head again, that I was not going to be able to focus on my day-to-day -day job as lieutenant, which if we would go to a structure fire or any incident, a car accident, hazardous material incident, rescue, uh, it's my job to see the bigger picture, and that's what situational awareness is. Uh, and it, it is really scanning your surroundings for signs of danger. 
And my worry was is that because everything, my thoughts were starting to be scattered, I was going to end up, uh, I was going to end up uh, missing the big picture. And I'll just give you a, a quick example of uh, that maybe anybody could relate to about situation awareness. If let's say you're driving, let's say 10 miles to get from point A to point B, you got a lot on your mind, you're driving, and all of a sudden you reach your destination and you have no idea how you got there, you have no idea how you stopped at stop stoplights, moving in and out of traffic, that would be loss of your situation awareness. As I said before, I had trouble sleeping. You know, right now I still only sleep about five and a half hours a night, but I go it has since lengthened, and as I go into my uh, CAM uh, protocols, you'll find out uh, what had happened, how it's lengthened. I used to wake up at 1 in the morning, 2 in the morning, 3 in the morning. Uh, now, my circadian rhythm as a, as a result of my job is disturbed anyway, but when I'm at home, I would have thought that maybe it would uh, temper itself, but it didn't. Now, my, now I'm sleeping a lot more where I do it in chunks and hopefully as things go along it'll get a little bit better. Irritable or having outbursts of anger, big thing for me. Uh, when I was in, in the, the years that I was at ACHS, it helped to temper that because I was involved in my studies, I was using all the CAM alternatives, but I was prone to violent outbursts. Uh, the biggest thing that I found about myself is that I had the inability to deal with conflict and at work I was battling and lashing out at the department, lashing out at other people, and I always wondered why was it that I was doing that? Why did I, why is it that I'm having trouble with these areas? But I, you know, still pushed it off, didn't think anything of it. Home improvement project, same thing. I would always get very irritable if things weren't going my way. Other things, guilt, anxiety, stress, and tension. Guilt about the event, including survivor guilt. Agitation, excitability, dizziness, fainting, feeling your heart being in your chest, headache. For the longest time, I held this deep-seated guilt. Why didn't I see this coming? Why didn't, why didn't I see it happen? What could I have done differently? So, again, just kept it, and it just was repressed in the back of my mind after about five years and I went from say 2003 to just this year when everything stirred itself back up. Now we're going to talk about uh, my my holistic protocols, what I did and I'll just preface this by saying that as we know holism is based on precepts of a balance between mind, body and spirit and I, I just liken it to be a holistic triangle if you will. Uh, the first thing that I realized or that I used was aromatherapy and I found that to be the gatekeeper to the balance of my holistic triangle. So everything that I've done or gone through my different modalities, aromatherapy has been a part of that in one way or another, whether it was suggested by another practitioner or it's something that I took on myself. Uh, a couple months ago I attended one of the webinars that Doreen did on the recent trends in aromatherapy and I asked her a question through LinkedIn is there anything about, is there any uh, articles out there or anything that you could tell me about uh, does aromatherapy help with uh, post-traumatic stress so she sent me this article that was written uh, and appeared in Military Spouse in February 2009 it was uh, written by our own Kate Hartman of ACHS at the time was Australasian College and she talked about alternative medical treatments, medicinal treatments, I'm sorry. And in there she talked about several different uh, or essential oils, bergamot, chamomile, geranium, lavender, lemon, pine, rosemary, rose, rosemary, and sandalwood. Uh, a few years ago I went through hernia surgery and I was taking Aroma 101 at the time and uh, I just I decided to make my own personal pain blend as I called it and I made a blend of lavender, geranium and sandalwood uh, and I purchased all these from the apothecary shop uh, and the reason I do that is because they are organic 
and their therapeutic grade oils. Uh, and to me, that guarantee, because it's certified organic, uh, it guarantees me that uh, these qualities are going to deliver the achieved and desired results. Uh, the reason I, how I chose these three blends or these three oils to blend is through the organolectic testing that we did in our labs for Aroma 101. And for whatever reason, these oils resonated with me highly, especially the geranium, which is in, uh, it's that middle note, that heart-centered note. Uh, and this blend that I did produced a sedative and hypnotic effect on my nervous system when I use it in conjunction with acupuncture. And acupuncture is the foundation of traditional Chinese medicine. It's the insertion of needles into various points of the body, and it restores the flow of qi, that life force, to the body's meridians. Uh, I chose on my own to try uh, acupuncture as a way of tempering the physical symptoms as well as some of the emotional. Uh, in, in the early sessions, uh, it produced strong neg a strong negative physical reaction in my body. My, uh, my acupuncturist, Aaron, told me that it's going to get ugly before it gets better. Uh, she said, just stick with me. We'll go, through we'll go through what we need to. They did a tongue analysis, pulse analysis, and this is something that I'm not an expert on, so I leave that for you to do research, or if you ask me a question later on, I can uh, find more answers out for you. Uh, and it's, my body was, it, it was uncontrolled, and I could not control what was going on, where it stiffened up, uh, my arms went in violent motion, and then eventually an acupuncturist grounded me with a menthol-based essential oil. But at some point I said, I thought to myself, I have this personal blend that I did a few years ago, I'm going to try it again and see what it does for me since it's something that I created and something that resonated with me uh, before. So when I brought it there, this blend induced the most amazing positive breakthrough in my treatment sessions as evidenced by the extensive journal that I was required to keep and what I, the, the things that I journal is what happens during the middle of the night and what happens during the day and I'm going to suggest to you if you are suffering from stress, post-traumatic stress, or you're going to be helping clients to journal, journal, journal everything that you do so you can go back to it later on uh, in event you're going to help somebody else and you can see what worked, what didn't work, but it also helps you to just put on paper what's going on with yourself. Uh, deep breathing is definitely an essential component of the treatment sessions and Erin always tells me when she puts the oils on me to first of all receive the love and the healing of the needles and then take five or six deep breaths in and out and then go where this spirit takes you and as I, as I said this is one of the most amazing experiences that I've had because my sleep has lengthened my my uh, physical signs and symptoms have uh, tempered themselves. I'm no, I no longer feel stress. I no longer am irritable at the things that it normally did. I can let it roll off my shoulders and I feel more balanced. The, I felt that this balanced the body component but some of the emotional as well of my holistic triangle. Then I did a session of Reiki, just one, it was, it, and that is something from the Japanese and it's ancient hand, laying on a hands healing technique that uses the life force energy to heal and balance the subtle energies within our bodies. Reiki addresses the physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual imbalances. What we were trying to do in my sessions were to balance the chakras, there are seven of them, and they are energy centers, they're like spinning wheels, and each corresponds to a different area laying along the spine which uh, controls or helps to govern certain areas or organs and organ systems of the body. One of the ones that they found was my throat chakra was blocked and the throat chakra corresponds to speaking our highest truths as well as just speaking uh, period and as I told you before I had a lot of trouble with conflict 
I would lash out at people. To me, that definitely signaled something wrong with uh, uh, with the uh, throat chakra itself. Uh, one of the things that I found out in doing a little research on the throat chakra, and it was just one—I think it was a aroma, uh, aroma web that I found it on that the stroke the throat chakra responds if you use oils there are several of them but three that I found were lavender geranium and sandalwood that it responds to and unbeknownst to me three years ago when I created this blend that it was going to come back and help me later on uh, so my my chakras were balanced within this one session uh, and then I was also recommended to soak in a bath with sea salts and lavender essential oil to help for nervous system support as well as detox uh, my body and I was told to do it at least 20 minutes a day uh, and the reason that the practitioner Lynn said to do that she said when you guys you absorb a lot of negative energy whether at the firehouse or on the calls that you respond to you need to detox yourself and remove it and uh, she is somebody that's a friend of mine because I, I work with her husband. He's my uh, uh, cohort that works on the other side of town. He's my fellow lieutenant. And he's also a Reiki master himself, but his wife handled it because we're too close. So I, I was told also continue to use my personal blend and once again come back and do deep breathing as an essential component of my treatment sessions. And to me, this balance, the spiritual component of the holistic triangle or my holistic triangle and then there was psychotherapy or talk therapy uh, Sarah my counselor who's also the clinical director of the support group I belong to uh, sitting with her she helped me to redefine thinking errors as well as work through any issues that were uncovered during the acupuncture Reiki sessions and as part of that journaling I did I started spilling things out what I realized and what I found out is that the, the suicide of my fi fellow firefighter was my trigger but the acupuncture opened my mind to going way back to when I was a kid and reliving several different traumas or traumatic experiences whether it was through bullying or uh, deaths of other friends close relatives uh, it, it it just brought all this out and then I was able to go into uh, my counseling sessions which started weekly for about a month and now I'm, now I'm extended to where I only have to go once a month. What I'm talking about with thinking errors was the biggest one for me was it's always said that when you go through like any type of uh, heart-wrenching experience that you leave a part of yourself out there with that person and I felt that this gentleman had taken part of my soul and Sarah made me help me to realize that you didn't lose anything he didn't take anything because you're still a whole person you're here you're living you're breathing you just need to redefine that and tell yourself he did not take anything from me I'm a whole I'm a balanced person uh, it's definitely a tremendous tremendous thing to go through with counseling and it's funny to see this picture here with a couch because I never did counseling before and when I walked in there I'm seeing three chairs in the office I'm like I asked her where's that where's the couch at uh, and she said well one of these days I might get one and we just had a good laugh from that but I definitely offer this to you as practitioners or future practitioners or somebody that may be suffering from stress or post-traumatic stress that you should go you should also include psychotherapy or counseling as part of your protocol because it will help you to make sense out of anything that's going to start spilling uh, spilling from your mind or your thoughts. Uh, and if you feel that you have you run across a client that may be suffering from something like this, or you and you're working with him or her on treatment protocols such as what I'm offering to you today. Uh, and you see that maybe they're still hanging in there or they're maybe they're making slow progress offer to them or definitely refer them to uh, 
a licensed clinical counselor, especially somebody that is trained to deal with uh, post-traumatic stress. And then I got some thoughts about self-care strategies. Uh, it's, as we know, it's always essential to look for the underlying cause. Again, my stressor, my trigger was a suicide of a fellow firefighter, but underlying causes were at all these little traumas that I faced along the way. And we also got to remember that we are all unique individuals and strategies that support and balance the mind, body, and spirit for one may not for another. So it's just going to be, if you're working with a client, you might want to do some organoleptic testing using some of those oils that uh, I talked about that Kate had listed. Uh, and I'll just give you an example of what she talks about with lavender is that it's it, it's just a fresh camphoraceous oil with soothing esters and as we know that's one of the essential oils that uh, has very few if none no contraindications for people other than if they just uh, the to them the aroma would be displeasing geranium it's a floor scented with natural sedatives and I could tell you that to me geranium is the strongest one that I resonate with out of my blend uh, it it's, it's intoxicating to me in the same way that if you would take a narcotic or some type of set of it, it's just, to me, it's an awesome, awesome uh, essential oil. And then our sandalwood, rich, spicy, woody, scented. It acts as an in, antidepressant by diminishing stress and tension. Now, sometimes I will, as I'm inhaling, I will smell that. Uh, Usually that lavender hits first, and it and it is short lived. But the geranium is the one that hangs along, hangs around the longest. And again, I've had great success with it. Uh, I'm going to encourage uh, you guys to reach out to ACHS and have them email you this, uh, email you this uh, military spouse article that Kate wrote. Uh, Big thing you got to remember too is anytime you consult with your primary care physician or naturopathic doctor uh, before making any significant changes to your health and wellness routine. And when you are working with the practitioners, alternative licensed counselors, it imperatives that you as an individual do the work that is asked of you. It is a two way relationship that requires effort from both sides. This makes for their uh, recovery a wonderful. Their, I'm sorry, it makes for a wonderful recovery experience. Uh, and what I mean by that, you have to do the work, and that's what both my, uh, are my acupuncturist and psychologist said to me on separate occasions. They both said, you are gonna, you're going to get along and move through quickly because you are doing the work. You're taking the time to journal. You're doing research on your own. Uh, You've come to the table with a lot. We're going to help you get through it. The thing is, I also gave permission to each, to each one of them to talk to each other. They did, and they both came to their agreement. This is what we're going to do to help Tim out. And again, there's no standard timeline for mind, body, spirit balance. Ask for help. It is not a sign of weakness, and that's the biggest thing that in the fire service and in and, and the world in general, if we ask for help, it seems to be a sign of weakness. Build a support system of family, friends, and trusted confidants. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. Uh, the effects of PTSD matters, so let's not remain silent. And when I talk about paying it forward, I'm talking about take what you learn from all your studies that you do here at ACHS, all of your experiences in life, learn from them, and pass it on to somebody else in the hopes that you will help them or show them that there is there is good in the world out there. I have several references on there that will be made available to you once this uh, in a couple days when this uh, webinar is released. And I just got a couple more things before we move on to questions. Be as I was opening up this webinar today, I'm a member of the American Legion, and I received an email from them, and it was something that is really hot off the presses. 
and it was a, a survey that they did in February of 3,100 respondents, and they found out that the treatment protocols that are being used right now, PTSD and traumatic brain injury care is not working. And what they found out of 3,100 respondents, 59% reported either feeling no improvement or worse after undergoing TBI and PTSD treatment, and 30% said they had terminated the treatment plan before completion. Uh, the results were discussed just two days ago at an American Legion Symposium on advancing care treatments for veterans with TBI and PTSD. Uh, about 20% who terminated their treatment plans early did so because of side effects associated with treatment, and 20% also ended it because of dissatisfaction. But an interesting thing is nearly half of all respondents had discussed some type of complementary and alternative based treatment with their providers. Uh, a sizable proportion of them reported prescriptions of up to 10 medications for the, for, to help them in their treatment experience. A couple other things that, that to take away from this is uh, they need to try to get people to seek treatment and again I think it goes back to that it's a sign of weakness. One, one of the other things that was discussed in there by Dr. Robert Kaufman of National Intrepid Center for Excellence said that one reason for taking a CAM approach is that 60 percent of veterans still meet the criteria for PTSD after they've undergone traditional treatments. Uh, another thing that they offered in there and this is definitely a definite, definite, definite uh, is that you have to include the caregiver, whether it be a spouse, a mother, a father, somebody that is going through this with these people. My wife had to go through a lot with me and and watch this. And and at the time, she just said, "Oh, that's that's just you being you, being impatient." But I told her once I realized I had a problem, this was something that was more magnified uh, than 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 just having. Temper, and again, that is something that growing up in my household as a kid, uh, mom and dad used to fight a lot, and our our dinner table was sometimes volatile. So maybe I did pick up those traits, but again, the PTSD magnified that. Uh, so you definitely want to include family members or any caregiver as part of the treatment protocol, or include them in there in your holistic treatment plan that you're gonna help uh, any future clients with or even yourself. So with that, uh, I'm going to ask Renee to come back here and we can open it up for some questions. If I do not know the answer right off, I will uh, get back to you through email or Renee's going to also make a list, give them to me, and then I will send them responses back there and she can post them on the ACHS blog. So with that, I bring Renee back. Hi, Tim. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for sharing your story. That um, was really amazing, and it's very brave to even be able to share that. So thank you so much um, and, from all and of us here. Right, and, and I, I, the reason that I did that is because I'm going to do this as much as I can for whoever I can at any opportunity because it is an important story, and I'm only just one of the many millions out there, and I'm sure there are veterans that have seen much, much worse than I have, and that's who I'm trying to reach out to as well. Yeah, well, we, we definitely thank you, and um, again, it's very, very brave, so thanks. Um, and so I'll go, ahead and, I'll go ahead and read a question from Dennis. Um, he would like to know, while doing a kind of an at-home project, such as working on my car, if it becomes difficult and I, become, it, um, I start to get shaky or a little bit out of breath and too weak to continue, um, is this an effect of my PTSD, possibly? Uh, well, the first thing I, I need to know is if you know is has he been uh, has he been diagnosed officially with PTSD? Uh, it could be just the normal stress response that's going on. If you're somebody that's been diagnosed, I could definitely say that I know with the home improvement projects that was a big, big struggle for me to try to harness my emotions and what I'm finding out now through all my treatment thing is going back to that deep breathing. If Dennis is somebody that is a student here and he has access to lavender, 
or if not, uh, he could buy some through the apothecary shop and try to use that to inhale that. But it, it, you're going to have to try to get that balance. You have to know whether or not that's actually a trigger for you or just something that is manifesting the bigger problem. I mean, other than that, I'm not sure that I could answer that. I'm not an expert on PTSD. I could say that that is something that I experienced, but until I knew what I was dealing with, I went day to day for over 16 years and probably longer than that in my life uh, without knowing that. I can't go into, I, if Dennis reaches out to me in an email, I could talk to him about a couple of things that came up in my, uh, through the acupuncture treatments that uh, I didn't hadn't thought about for a year and it, it concerned like bullying with people that were actually not just bullies but uh, bona fide psychopaths. Right. Yeah, I would think um, that's definitely something, Dennis, that you would want to also bring up to your, you know, your primary care practitioner and see, um, you know, if exactly. you've already been diagnosed and maybe definitely discuss that with them. Um, exactly. Yeah, the next question comes from Marlena Green, and she would like to know, um, I want to know what your thoughts are on the warrior transition unit used by the Army to help transition soldiers into society by using highly sedate, sedative chemical prescription drugs, such um, and such units being located in places such as Alaska, where the soldiers do not even get sufficient sunlight, and they're given given things, um, and excuse me if I mispronounce these, uh, these drugs, clonopin and Ambien to deal with depression and sleeplessness only to lead to addiction. Do you think that natural medicine will ever make its way into units like this to, hope with the climb, to help with the climbing rate um, of PTSD soldiers? Right. I'm not exactly 100% familiar with that, but I can just refer back. I'll refer her to this article that I just got, and again, I will send it to you, Renee, uh, the link to Legion survey. And it definitely talks about uh, how there some of them are reported prescriptions of up to 10 medications. And this Legion survey definitely points to the fact that it's not helping them. Over 59% uh, reported feeling no improvement or worse after undergoing treatment for post-traumatic brain injury and PTSD treatment. Uh, so we definitely stayed out there. And where I find the hope was in that in this uh, symposium that they had a couple days ago, they mention complementary and alternative medicine as an approach. 60% of medicine, they, they're saying that the reason they need to take a camera approach is that the 60% of veterans still meet their criteria for post-traumatic stress after they've undergone traditional treatments. And nearly half of them had discussed some type of complementary and alternative based treatment with their providers. Now. In this article, it gives a link to the complete survey. So once you get that, you click on it. You cl you click on it, and it'll take you there. I myself did not have the time because we had to get into the. I had to start getting into the webinar, but I'm going to go back after this, and I'm going to read that. If uh, Marlena reaches out to me, I'll in the next couple of days. What I'll try to do is I'll read this complete survey, try to make sense out of it, and then I can. Uh, answer a question a little bit better but because I'm not a I'm not a medical or a licensed primary care uh, forgive her, uh, provider I can't really comment on what like the psychotropic drugs all I'm gonna tell you is that I find hope in it that they are having a discussion on it that CAM needs to be involved in this whether or not the survey goes into it a little bit more about what types of CAM or if any of these soldiers did in fact use CAM. That's not said in this little synopsis here. But if she contacts me by email, we could have a little discussion there. Our next question comes from Christina, and she would like to know: When you began Reiki, did you feel did you feel that it stirred up issues for you? Um, stirred up issues for you at first. So I guess similar to your to your acupuncture experience. Right, and and the, the thing is, the Reiki it was only one session, and it came along after about a month of acupuncture and a uh, about two or three weeks of psychotherapy. So I didn't get a lot of major uh, uh, signs and symptoms like when I like with the, my body un losing control of itself and my arms 
and, and legs becoming rigid when I went through some of the acupuncture treatments. I didn't feel that uh, immediately, but later on I felt like like a great weight was lifted off of me that I had a thousand pounds on me and somebody lifted it off of me. Uh, one of the things is that this uh, practitioner was also a, an intuitive and she had asked me somewhere during the session, you know, did I did I know anybody that uh, liked roses? And I said, why do you ask? Because I smell the scent of roses in the room and that usually signifies a female presence here. And I said, well, that would have been my mother-in-law and she passed away about five years ago. Uh, she definitely was somebody that loved roses. And I asked her, is she saying anything? And she said, well, I can't really that would be a whole nother level I'd have to go to and uh, you know right now that would take a lot of energy out of me so we're only focusing on your chakras uh, just know that she's present in the room that's the only thing really that came out of the Reiki session other than the fact that all chakras were balanced and sealed in very easily it didn't take long the whole session was probably a little over an hour but I was brought into line and then now I just got to continue with what she said, soaking in lavender and sea salt and things like that. Great. Um, okay, so our next question comes from Naomi and she would like uh, she would like to know, I am currently working with a number of individuals with PTSD in the community, community meta, mental health field. I'm wondering if you know of resources for those who are fixed, who are on fixed income or experiencing homelessness. You know, I do not, I couldn't, I'd have to get back to her on that question. I'd have to look that up. So I do not know that. Uh, some of the, you know, maybe she can go to, there's something called PTSD United. If she just did a Google search on that, that's where I picked up some of the, uh, some of my statistics from. And it has on there resources, uh, what they do, uh, the National Institute of Mental Health, she might be able to go to that as well. Uh, I found some other statistics and it's just about veterans. It's called Face the Facts USA. Uh, she might be able to go to there and glean some uh, information off of there uh, as far as uh, what resources to deal with people that are uh, on fixed incomes. Because right now I do not have that answer. Again, if she reaches out to me in email, uh, I will try to find something between now and then and get back to her on that. Great. Okay, so I think we have time for one more question, again, from uh, Marlena. She would like to know, what are your thoughts on the treatment of secondary PTSD? Secondary PTSD, uh, and anything I did research on, I'm not sure what secondary PTSD is, other than I would think that that would be I mean, it, it's got to be something other than your primary trigger. Uh, I think just I can only speak for myself and how the CAM uh, protocols that I use as well as psychotherapy uh, help me tremendously. And as I said before, three months ago, I couldn't even sit here doing this fluid of a conversation and talking to you about that. If she's still out there and could give me a little bit of definition on secondary PTSD, or again contact me by email, and we she could she could uh, expand on uh, the the term, and maybe I could have a little bit more to go on from there. Great, yeah, and again um, for anybody who wants to follow up with Tim, his email address is t a n d j one zero nine six at yahoo.com. So if you have um, more questions, you can email him, or you can also email me. Um, at Renee, R E N E E, long, L O N G, at ACHS edu um, for any follow up questions. And we're going to try to uh, put a blog together for any of the questions that um, we didn't get to or required a little bit more research. So, again, thank you so much, Tim. This was a phenomenal webinar on a really, really important topic. Um, it's great that June is PTSD Awareness Month and that we're able to do something like this. Um, to kind of create awareness and tell stories like your own. So thank you again. Uh, you're you're very welcome, and it's been an honor and a privilege to uh, spend this last hour with uh, everybody out there listening, as well as uh, my ACHS family. Awesome. 
And just so everybody knows, there will be an email that will go out tomorrow with a free recording of today's webinar. And just one minor correction. Um, the article that we cited here in the PowerPoint, Military Spouse, actually made a typo. It's actually written by Doreen Peterson, our president here at ACHS, and not Kate Harmon. Um, so just uh, we will send that article out. We'll give you guys that link. But just uh, know that it was uh, actually written by Doreen Peterson. Um, yeah, so there will be an email tomorrow with these slides as well as the article and as well as the video recording of this webinar. So if you enjoyed this webinar, you should also look into any of ACHS's accredited online courses. Um, so there are a great many options for anybody who's just starting out, such as Aroma 101 and Nat 101, um, Nutrition, Body Care, and Herbalism. And we also have wonderful master's programs and continuing ed options for anyone seeking to deeper, deepen your knowledge on holistic wellness protocols. Um, for issues such as PTSD. Um, you can also find out more by scheduling a time to talk with an advisor. Uh, you can follow the link. It should be up on your screen. Yep, set, speak with an admissions advisor. Um, you can also give us a call at 800-487-8839. So thanks again, everyone, for attending our webinar. And we typically host webinars twice a month. So if you enjoyed today's webinar, uh, keep an eye out for future invites. And lastly, don't forget to like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash ACHSEDU. And also follow us on Twitter at the handle at ACHSEDU. Sorry, I'll repeat that. <laughs> it's at ACHSEDU. Um, for webinar announcements, college events, and holistic health news. So thanks again, everyone. Have a wonderful day.